Hello, welcome, and thank you for joining the second of three UX Design Industry Night panels. My name is Christina Fiedrich. I'm the Manager of Credential Programs at Emily Carr University Continuing Studies. Industry Nights offer recent graduates and current students of the User Experience Design Program valuable insights into industry as they start on new and exciting career paths. We also want to welcome members of the broader Emily Carr community who have been joining us um, yesterday and today as well. This event is hosted by Emily Carr Continuing Studies, and I'm joining this event today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. I'm grateful to live, work, and connect with you from the territories of the Coast Salish peoples, but also through online portals, we may be connecting across many different traditional territories and lands. In these digitally mediated times, it is more important than ever to connect back to the land, so I encourage you to also take a moment to acknowledge the land on which you live and learn. Today's panel offers insights into UX internships, requirements, best practices for application and interview, interview processes, what to prepare for and what to expect. UX internships offer valuable opportunities to experience real challenges of design work. Whether applying to work with a specific company, industry, design team, or location, internships are competitive and require preparation. Joining today to share their insights are guests Bob Warner, Michelle Yao, and Leon Zhang. So I'm going to turn it over to the panelists, um, starting with Bob, to give their introductions. Hello, hello. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm calling in from Euclid at BC. Uh, I'm one of the people who migrated during the pandemic. So I moved out here from Vancouver last year and I've been here for a year and loving it. So um, a little bit about myself. Um, I went back to school in my 30s. I used to work in film and uh, kind of hit a wall. It was a lot of a lot of work, man. So and I always wanted to go to Emily Carr. So I applied, I got in. And so that's when I went back to get my interaction uh, degree. Um, so after that, when graduating, I wanted to know, I wasn't sure where to go, but I knew I wanted it to be a name. I was thinking like enterprise business. My idea was like, oh, I want to work at Google. So if I could get in a tech company that's known, it'll be like a step to there. So in Vancouver, that was SAP. <clears throat> so I started as an intern and uh, then was a UX design specialist there where I got to work in data analytics. Um, at that point, you know, I was just trying to establish myself, but I figured out that I, um, my previous work experience helped. So being a returning student and having some experience in the uh, business world really helped. And I also learned that I really like complex problems. So to be able to dig in and solve those types of problems um, really kind of set me on my trajectory. Um, after that, I ended up going to Progressa, which is a fintech company. Um, they do loan management, and I was a senior designer there. Uh, so I got to help build their design system from the ground up, and it really kind of challenged me to expand into systems thinking and to um, think about uh, the broad um, application that we were working on. Um, it was also the first time that I ever got to uh, really do design interviews. So it was sort of my proving ground to be able to uh, start uh, talking to people, seeing how people um, hold interviews, what design challenges are like. And um, there was a really great design challenge that they brought to the table. The architect had one, which was to design a parking lot, which was so outside of left field because it wasn't a digital challenge, uh, but it really did show how people think through a problem. So I brought that on with me into my next company. Um, so uh, I also, in the meantime, have done some sessional instruction at Emily Carr. So it was really fun to be back at university uh, and helping out there with some teaching. There I learned that um, it's so helpful to be able to say what's normal and what's not. So uh, through experience, you can look back and when somebody says, oh, this is happening and I, I, can't, I can't believe it, it, it's nice to hear, you know, that's normal, that this will happen. Um, it's okay, here are some things you can do to, to work through that. So that was something that stood out to me when I went back, because I know I was that person freaking out in university. Um, and so uh, after that, I, I landed at Copperleaf. So Copperleaf helps companies make decisions on how they spend their money. So they have some technologies that are built in that, that help them make some of these complex decisions. 
Um, I started as a senior designer, uh, then became a lead, and uh, I'm now a design manager for the core product. So um, it's fun because, you know, I continue to be breaking down really, really big problems. Um, and recently, uh, in a manager role, it's been interesting because people, people have complexities as well. So that's been kind of fun. I've also been a key um, hiring manager for, um, for our area. So it's been interesting to be able to kind of do that on a regular basis and get to know sort of the ins and outs of hiring. So for hiring, it's been fun to, to kind of learn about case studies, what's important in case studies, see how people present, uh, to be able to kind of know when, a, when someone stands out as being um, someone you'd want to hire. And just to realize also, like, I don't care if they mess up, really. I more care about how they recover. So it's, it's for me, the realization has been that I don't strive for perfection, I strive for honesty. And so that's sort of what I hire, hire to as well. So it's, it's more of a better quality for me to see someone struggle a bit and then be honest about it and, and show how they can be supported in that than to you know, collapse in failure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and the, the big thing that stood out to me too is that everybody who gets to that hiring stage usually knows the basics. So what I'm usually looking for is, is um, things around the basics. So research insights, uh, are they able to really get the right context and do they work with user stories and what are their leadership skills like and do they have a growth mindset? So these have been some interesting things that I've watched and kind of uh, learned along the way. So yeah, I'm still at Copperleaf and I'm pretty happy there and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much, Bob. That was a great start. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to Michelle next. Yeah, thanks, Bob, for the great intro. And then um, I prepare a little thing, so I'm just gonna present now. Awesome. Yeah. So my name's Michelle, and then uh, for title wise, I I just realized I put a wrong thing here. Anyway, so um, my title usually like designer and founder. Um, by day, I work at a startup from Boston called JobGet. So it's an already job recruiting platform. So I work on the employer side. I was the founding designer, which means like, um, yeah, so the also the first hire in Canada. So um, it was pretty interesting process. I'll walk you um, all of you through a little bit later. Um, and then for like on the side, I also Oops, I also run a um, nonprofit or, well, it's nonprofit right now. I'll explain that a little bit later too. So um, just a more, a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Beijing and then um, lived in UK and USA a little bit the, before I settled down in Vancouver for school. So um, I'm a person with a lot of ideas because I studied idea. Um, I study interruption design and electronic arts. So um, I did a master um, for like the program called Master of Design in Emily Carr back in 2017. So I um, graduated around two years ago. Uh, by then actually there's like interdisciplinary, which means you don't actually have a direction, but my direction mostly focused on media art and electronic arts. So um, sometimes during the day, people thought I'm kind of like, this is my day to day, very like, um, iconic, that's sticky notes on the wall, that's UX designer life, like for like potentially your glamorous LinkedIn profile, what kind of company you worked in. Um, but what I'm actually passionate about, this was how I look like. Basically, most of the time when I was at Emily Carr, um, it was the best two years of my life. It was really exhausting. I think at least 50% of the days I'm staying there until the school closed. So I'm um, like soldering, burning a lot of things. Um, but that's what media art is like. And then I'm always passionate about that. Um, yeah, so just some past projects I made outside from uh, my design career. I thought it's just an um, important part of who I am and then um, as a creative individual myself. Um, yeah, so this one, it's mostly, I know we wanted to talk about um, internships. So I'm, um, I just wanted to keep it short. I, know like most people will probably only see these two um, from like LinkedIn and Microsoft I interned um, but like if we took a look at like a bird's eye view it took a long journey for me from like um, from 18 to what I'm or who, who I am right now like 25 26 to become an industry alumni um, all the way I was a freshman in college so how's the journey was like so um, I guess just wanted to say there's a lot of up and downs um, there's also time you might see like 
um, it says MDES first year, it's this like a little crying face because I couldn't find anything in Vancouver when I first moved here. Um, and then it was like very, very desperate for me. And then I felt very lonely. And then um, just I used to watch a YouTube tutorial. Um, and that episode, I remember very clear one day I filled an interview, I went home and then um, I watched that video again. So that's like, that's the episode of designer encouraging everyone just to keep designing. There will be better opportunities. There will be um, better clients. And I just like crying with my cat watching that um, <laughs> for a good amount of time. So um, yeah, so just to wanted to um, also to um, encourage everyone just to keep designing. And then there's a lot of potential paths you can take um, even from that from that crying phase, I could potentially, that time I was offered um, from a branding uh, internship actually, but I didn't take it. But looking back, there's a lot of potential. Um, if I end up taking that, I'm probably not gonna go down the path where like UX product design, I'm probably in New York City or Toronto doing creative direction right now. So um, yeah, it's been a short journey, um, but like looking back, it's a very interesting journey as well. Um, yeah, and then really glad to be here today. And then I'll pass on to Leon. Thank you so much, Michelle. Yeah, that was, both of these acts were quite hard to follow, but I'll do my best. Okay, so can everyone see my screen all right? Yes, okay, so I'll start. And since I'm going last, uh, I'll make sure I do my best to control the time here. Um, so yeah, my name is Leon. Um, I, so I'm from the University of Washington. I'm doing a five-year program there. So uh, I wouldn't exactly call it a master's, but it's a little bit of a special, I guess, uh, version of the uh, bachelor's uh, interaction design program that offered there. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm also from the PNW area, uh, similar to Michelle. I originally grew up in Beijing and then I came here um, for college. Uh, that's a little bit about myself. Uh, but of course, I know for today's panel, we're mostly talking about like internship, entering into the work, transitioning from student into industry. So I won't talk too much about my education background, but uh, I do want to build off of what Michelle just said. Um, there is going to be a lot of up and downs. So I'll briefly move forward um, to my work experience here. Uh, there's going to be so much up and downs that um, on your LinkedIn, on your resume, you know, we try to show the best of ourselves. So you might say like, oh, this is also glamorous. You know, these people, like how, how, how did they do it? But um, the, you'll see through the, this mini presentation that it's not really like that. Uh, obviously we're trying to show the best of ourselves when we're applying to jobs, but uh, having these ups and downs will be super normal. And I remember one time when a hiring manager was asking me, what's your greatest like UX, um, not UX, but like what's your superpower? And I said, I'm really good at being a failure. Um, and I played to that because I think that's true, right? Uh, people who uh, don't know how to kind of learn from their failures. Uh, I don't really want to use that word. So I guess setbacks, uh, they won't really grow as a designer. And as designers, I think it's really important that we always keep that learning mindset. Uh, so bouncing back a little bit, uh, currently I'm working at Expedia. Uh, last summer I was interning at Amazon. So I'm also uh, a bit newer to my career. Um, I think a lot of you might know me for writing some articles. I think that might be um, one of the initial reasons why people were reaching out to me. Um, this is one of the more uh, kind of well-known articles to help people with internships. Um, and yeah, so going back to this experience, um, even though I've been a student, uh, something I am quite proud of is I try really hard to find these um, work opportunities, even when I'm still going to school, right? Um, and I think right now, uh, because of COVID and remote work, there are more opportunities than before. So that's always something we can try to leverage. Uh, but even before COVID, um, I interned back in Beijing. My first internship was um, at a design firm called Uniway, where we worked with um, some large clients such as Neo and Huawei before all the complications. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about my VR experience as well, since I know that's something people might be curious of. And kind of big tech, um, Amazon Expedia is something um, I had some more experience with. So this was kind of my first um, design intern experience or real industry experience. This was back in 2017, 2018. I wanna highlight this one here because you can see this one was like an exhibit design thing, uh, very different from UX. But I think it's important to know that when we're kind of new to our career, it's totally okay to try to do things that you might feel like don't exactly fit into what you want to do. 
uh, just because when you're so new to your career, everything is a learning experience. And eventually, when you're a bit more down the road, you'll find like all these dots start to tie together. So when I'm working on this exhibit design, I could work a lot with 3D um, people, uh, 3D modelers, uh, people who interacted things in Unity. And a lot of that really helped out later when I'm doing my VR work. Um, yeah, so talking a little bit about my VR work, um, Sword Reverie is my main uh, creative outlet for that. Uh, and it was really interesting because for Sword Reverie, um, we launched a Kickstarter a few years ago. It was really successful. This is kind of like how the game looked, just for some context. Um, and this was something I really took ownership on. So I won't go into this too much, but what I want to emphasize with this was I only had that opportunity because that year was the year where my internship at Google was canceled. And that was something I felt like was a huge setback. Uh, obviously, I worked really hard to try to get that internship and trying to deal with the canceled internship was something I think I wasn't really able to prep for. COVID was super out of the ordinary. But because of learning from that, uh, I'm trying to like, I guess, take what opportunities, I, whatever I, opportunities I can. Uh, I was able to learn a lot more by launching Kickstarter with the team, right? Because I got to learn more about business, taking ownership, working with a lot tighter constraints, um, right? Trying to make an impact and how to launch something that, you know, can really be successful. We were fully funded in 72 hours, being one of the top 10 funded uh, titles. So um, all that being said, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more questions about some of those experiences and um, some of the uh, internship application details. So I'll save that for uh, the Q&A. But yeah, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. That was a really great introduction for this panel. Um, I've been furiously writing some notes down uh, to continue following up on uh, what you've all mentioned here. Um, so I do want to go into some of the questions that we've prepared for you first. Um, so in any particular order, um, if anybody wants to just jump in. Um, so with both big names in tech, so we've seen that uh, some of you've worked with Amazon, with Google, um, but also there have been opportunities with startup companies and just smaller kind of uh, independent projects that you can work on. Uh, when you have all of these different competing opportunities or there's just like such a broad spectrum of opportunities, offering internships, et cetera, how can prospective interns or new graduates decide which to apply for? I can uh, give, give my perspective. Um, I think something to consider is that there are a few categories that you could choose. Um, so when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about enterprise versus agency versus contract versus entrepreneurial. Like I actually wasn't thinking entrepreneurial at the time. I didn't have that mindset, but that's something you could do as well. So it matters. Um, most of the people who I knew who chose a category are still in that category. So um, if you went into the agency, often what you end up doing is creating artifacts that defend you in that category. So it builds and builds and builds. So think about where you want to go. There's pros and cons to either, um, both in like salary and also in autonomy and um, visual design. So um, it's worth considering if any of those appeal to you. Um, it's also not a cliff, it's more of a hill, so uh, you can change, uh, but just know that your choices do matter. Um, and uh, remote changes everything, so you can kind of think a bit broader, I think. Um, you're not really stuck to your area, and we found it's, it's even harder to hire at this point because it's just kind of spread around, around the planet. So do think about that. Um, look outside, think about what time zone you want to work in, and then check that out. <laughs> um, also culture matters. So if you're really like, ultimately when I was doing an internship, you, the goal is you wanna get hired. So um, think about a company that you're really interested in staying at uh, because you might wanna um, plant there. Um, the other thing is to, to consider what your values are. So um, this is something that if you do early on, it can actually help guide a lot of your decisions along the way. And it can course correct. Like often when I was frustrated in my career, I would go back to my values and I'd realize, okay, well, I'm not feeling a sense of community or I don't have the autonomy that I wanted. So that's something if you start now um, and get those written down, it'll actually be really a really big help for you as you're, um, as you're starting out. And sometimes it's not the right fit. So this is the thing when I was first starting, I was like, oh man, I got to get this job. But 
but it's sometimes it just isn't the right job. And so one of the things to remember is that you're, you're amazing and you're bringing a huge amount of talent and growth and there's an opportunity there. So you should also be interviewing the company. So I think we often forget that, that like we have to like prove ourselves to them, but in, in a way you're still choosing where you want to go. And so a lot of times it's nice when you get these challenging questions back because you're like, oh, they know who they are and they know what they're looking for. And that's something that's kind of interesting. It's a different it's a different thing that you might get uh, from somebody who's applying to an internship. So those are some things that might um, help guide you and give you a bit of an advantage uh, from my perspective. I can follow. Michelle? Oh, great. Um, so two things I want to build off a bit more um, of what Bob said, kind of from a more um, applicant perspective. Um, is I think having a long-term mindset versus a short-term one um, is really important. Um, so I know a lot of people, um, you know, like this is a stressful experience. I'm not going to lie, right? I write a lot of articles about this when I help students. Um, depending on your, I think, personal style, you might be someone who kind of sleeps better at night if you feel like I apply to every job out there. So this is who I am. That might be your style. Definitely do it. On the other hand, you might be someone who says, you know, I really know I want to do this one specific thing. So I'm going to try my best to learn all about that, do all the networking and just try to focus on this one niche area. So, you know, there's a lot of different styles out there. Um, but regardless of what your plan is, you should have a long term kind of mindset, right? Um, do you want to have your own maybe like a creative firm in five to 10 years? Or do you want to work in big tech, maybe be a senior designer, individual contributor? Having those will definitely affect your short-term kind of planning and, um, I guess, decision-making. Um, one suggestion I would give is if you're really just someone who wants to get that first work experience, of course, don't be too picky. Um, this is a competitive market. I'm sure you have a lot of talent. Um, mutual selection is really important. I want to build off that a little bit later. But um, right now, if this is really your first work experience, um, I don't want you to think that I like, for example, if I say I want to be a UX designer at a big tech, and then you don't have an offer um, that you think is appealing, should that mean that you shut every op every option out? Um, I don't think so. Um, and I think from my own experience, right, a lot of that early kind of career opportunity uh, will feed into one another. Um, sure, changing tracks later on, uh, like Bob said, could present some challenges. But having some experience is always better than nothing. Um, that's something I would definitely emphasize. Uh, my first work experience back in China for the design firm, um, even though it was a really competitive firm in China, Beijing, uh, the pay was 100 RMB per day. So that's about $10, uh, like maybe $15 USD per day of work, which is, you know, very not ideal to many, I would say, but I get to learn a lot, right? So to me, that's a great experience. Um, and the last point I will um, say is mutual selection is really important. Um, even if... Um, you know, you're someone who feels like I'm not too confident yet. I don't have too many experiences yet. Uh, don't sell yourself short. Uh, when you're chatting with these companies, when you're making the um, decisions, uh, even if you're new to the industry, you should always feel like I'm kind of in charge of my own future. You know, it's very important whether you're in a role or when you're still applying for a role, uh, you should know what you want. Um, you shouldn't wait for someone to tell you what's best for you. So if you think the company, even it might be well known, it might be a big brand, um, if you feel like that's not the right fit for you, you know, don't be afraid to have those concerns. Um, so I think mutual selection is something when you do have the offers, you should definitely think about. But before you kind of move to that point, uh, definitely also be open minded. Don't be too picky. So it's a very balanced. Um, everyone, I think, should kind of consider that. Yeah, I think um, Bob and Leon already cover a good amount of that. Um, I just. Thinking about the question, honestly, I didn't get to choose when I was a student. Um, most of the time, I don't have the chance to choose it because even, yeah, I think for me, um, just looking back, I will just encourage everyone to try as many as you could. So um, I guess that's a little bit contradicts to um, what the other two like has, has said, but um, that's basically, I guess, depends on your personality and also the kind of life you want. Um, for me, just looking back, if I haven't done my very first design gig or even not internship was like when I was like 18, first like freshman year, I was um, taking some freelancing gig from for my cousin's online store, literally like do some photography shooting 
um, build out a website for him, and I got paid, um, yeah, equal amount as Leon did. <laughs> um, so um, later on, I went to like two startups. I did two different roles for like visual design first and then UX design after. And then I tried a product manager role at LinkedIn actually. So um, just also like try different roles to, and try different scale of companies. Um, I think like for me, if I didn't try out like bigger tech and the smaller startups, I wouldn't know I'm not passionate to tech. So that's why I didn't chose going back to tech for my first full-time job. Um, I went for a creative studio. So like, um, I think it's always try to keep yourself, um, just like don't limit yourself for what kind of thing you can do. So um, even I'm not from graphic design background at all. I didn't even know how to use Illustrator properly, but I got a branding um, and like creative agency offer too. So um, just uh, focus on what you really love and to think about what uh, what's your passion about and what matters to you. So I think that's the most important thing. Um, but I do wanted to mention, like, I do think those two big tech internship I did, although I didn't enjoy it, um, we can talk about that later, but that's literally looking back, that was kind of like the pivot point for my career. Um, so if you do have the chance, try it out. Uh, maybe you'll hate it like I did, um, but um, the, I think the beauty for internship is low attachment and low commitment. The worst thing it can happen, it's just like four months or eight months uh, maximum, you're, you can just like uh, not doing it anymore, not taking the return offer. If it doesn't work well, if it does work well, well, congratulations, you already kind of like found something you like, um, but it doesn't work for everyone. So um, if you didn't happen to like some experience, at least you know, like next time you choose where next time you have to make a choice for like long-term commitment for full-time job, you'll learn, learn that a lot better. Yeah. Michelle, I just want to quickly add on to your point. Um, I, I do also think like for me personally, I was someone who, I think for the first time around um, a few years ago when I was only applying, um, when I was in my, can't remember which year of college, but that year I didn't apply to that many. And I think when I got the offer from Google, I was very happy and I didn't have any other applications. And I think that's also why um, when COVID hit, you know, the position got closed. Um, that kind of hit me extra hard because even though it's technically not my fault, I still feel like I didn't do, or I guess I could have foreseen it and maybe done something else. So for me personally, I would say I agree with you, like applying to every role out there or, you know, applying to all the ones you think you're interested in is a great thing to do, especially when you're early on in your career. So don't feel like there's anything wrong with doing that. And the other thing I want to say is like, um, depending on your, like, you know, this is a very real world we live in, right? Like you might have these personal constraints. Uh, you might not have, uh, you might need to sponsor visa. Uh, so maybe looking to a big tech is uh, going to be a bit easier for you, right? Because big tech companies are going to be uh, more lenient and more willing to sponsor your visa. Um, depending on some other things, um, whether um, maybe your financial situation, you might really want to get a higher pay to save up a down payment for a house. So like there's always these other concerns and that's never anything to be ashamed of, you know, like we're all human, we all have other constraints. So yeah, just want to add that a little bit. Thank you so much, everybody, for sharing your insights. Um, we did actually have a question from somebody. Um, Leon already responded, but um, I think it builds into some other questions that we had prepared. So maybe I'm going to weave them together a little bit here. Um, so my question to you is, in your experience, what would you what kind of advice would you give for making the most out of an internship so regardless of whether you're actually enjoying it um, maybe you have an experience similar to michelle where um, you didn't like the internship or you realized that this was not the right place for you um, so in those kinds of cases um, what would you do to make sure that you're getting the most out of it for yourself Um, yeah, maybe I can um, go first on this. Um, I remember very clear that was, um, this is not an advertisement for Microsoft, but I think that was like value prop or something Microsoft written on my first orientation day. So I think it perfectly covered um, how you're going to make most of it. So first, um, like try new things. And then secondly, um, wait, I think it just blanked out. I think lastly was, um, oh yeah, learn from others, try new things. Lastly, embrace the journey. So um, 
learn from others very um, just like straightforward. So um, you're gonna meet a lot of like peers. It might be a little bit when it's virtual. So make it the most use of it. Try to network with as many people as you could. Um, it could be someone within your group, outside your group, um, even like someone you're not like working day to day with. That's a great chance to get to know people and also like assess the company. Um, do you want to work here long term in the future? So that's a great uh, point to start. So and um, try new things is definitely, I think, um, no matter it's like you like the job itself or not, um, it's always a good opportunity to try something you never tried before. So um, if you happen to um, like you don't know how the thing's working, that's a great chance to try it out. And lastly, embrace the journey. It's basically just, um, I, I guess, like good or bad, try to enjoy it and take that as an experience. If it's good, then we call it. Um, it's like, it's, it's a fortunate to, to be in somewhere you actually really enjoy, you like it and you stay, if it's not, that's an experience too. So, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of like, um, that might just take away from the, um, how to make the most of it. Neon or Bob, do you have any, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, sure. I can throw some things in there. <clears throat> so um, I would, I wish I had gotten a mentor early. Um, so I had, I had my leads that I would run things through, but a mentor really does make a big difference. So it doesn't have to be at your company, but look at who you can have as a mentor and work with that person to improve. So you might also want to get a buddy at your work. Uh, some works assign a buddy, but if you can say like, Hey, um, I'm new here. Can I, can I work jam with you on some of my designs? You can book, book like a couple hour sessions with them if they have time that can help you kind of um, skip a lot of steps. Sometimes when you're working next to someone, you can kind of see how they work through things. <clears throat> also be clear about what you want to learn. So, you know, moving into work, you, you set your agenda, you sort of need to set your professional development goals. So, um, if you would like research, then make sure that your lead knows that you like research and that you want to try to find some things like that, especially in your internship. Really, you should be kind of spread into the areas where you want to grow. So think about that and be prepared to talk about that. You might consider booking meetings with the people on your team. Sometimes it's a little timid and you're like, oh, I don't know, I got to go join these things. But it's, you know, like I said, it's up to you. So you can get to know these people and say hi and go for a coffee. So it shows shows initiative and you kind of set it at your own pace and, and you really kind of uh, settle yourself in. You um, One thing you might consider too, so usually uh, companies have uh, a matrix that allows you to move from level one, two, three, four. And when you're coming in at a co-op, you're sort of below the level one. So you could work with your team lead to um, assess where you are based on the level one. And you could actually spend your internship training into level one. So that when you leave, you feel like you could kind of be capable at their, their matrix. Um, so that's something you could, all these things you could kind of initiate and ask for. Um, and a big one for me is that there, there ultimately is a shift in mindset. So when we get out of university, we're sort of trying to prove, I'll just say me, I was trying to prove myself. I was like, I'm a designer. I'm working at this company. I'm, I'm finally doing it. And it's kind of, it freaked me out a lot. And so there's a, a <clears throat> for me, there was a tendency to be timid and to not really give my point of view and to really just kind of. There's, a, there's an element of growth that happens, but at some point there has to be that switch where you become a designer with a point of view. So I think in your co-op, the real big trick is if you can start to realize what your point of view as a designer and think about how you can speak to your point of view and why you believe in your design decisions. Um, and that will help you when you finally kind of land as a, as a designer. So that's sort of a mindset thing that can continue on even even into your designer phase. So the more you know about it and the more you can look at it and address it, at least you kind of, you end up being above it and not fully controlled by it. Um, soft skills are really important too. So most of the people who are starting as an intern know the basics of design. And so you're, you really could dig in and understand what the, corp, corp, the company's meeting etiquette is, um, how they do documentation to make sure things aren't lost, what sort of uh, mechanisms are there for context gathering and stakeholder management? How do you communicate risk? Um, all these things would help you outside of being able to do wireframes and iterate. Also, if you like the company, be clear. Say, I want a job when this is done. 
what can I do to get that? Like it's often, often where there's sort of, I was afraid to say it. And it was near the end that I realized like, you almost have to like, just claim it. So don't be afraid to do that. If you really like where you are, be clear, say, say you want to stay. Okay, I'll do a quick wrap up. Um, so I think for this question, um, going back to, a little bit to the original question of um, kind of making the most of the internship, I think it'll really depend a little bit about um, what kind of role you're in, what's the company structure. Uh, I think um, the example Bob gave was really great. I think, you know, aligns with a lot of what I think I took away from interning at Amazon. Um, there's, you know, at these big tech companies, there's these structures, right? Amazon has these leadership principles for those who of you who might have intern interviewed or worked at Amazon, right? Uh, we talk about like learn and be curious. We talk about uh, have a backbone, disagree and commit. So I think those were two points um, Bob just mentioned. And during our internship at Amazon, those will be things that your mentor, you know, kind of works with you a lot to kind of learn. But I think that really applies to a lot of companies. And I also want to emphasize that even when you're not working or interning at a big tech company, there's still a lot to learn and a lot to grow. And I would even argue that you're kind of learning different things. Um, when I was working with the indie game company, uh, Sword Reverie, very small startup uh, based in Seattle. Um, and when I'm in that role, uh, I kind of was a solo designer at one point. Um, and you really get to wear multiple hats. So it's a very different learning experience than uh, working on a big tech, right? Big tech, very well structured. Uh, like Bob said, clear matrices, you are expected to fill these um, roles, you're expected to learn these things. Um, of course, you can do better than expectation, but you know, the structure is usually pretty clear. Uh, when you're at a smaller startup company, a lot of times you get thrown a bunch of random stuff. One day you might be making them a random website, one day you might be making some email ads, like maybe your title is a UX designer, but you know, you get to learn a lot more about the business, about the product. Um, so yeah, it really depends on kind of your style. And I think depending on where you're at, you should always kind of be grateful for the opportunity. Um, there's always a lot of those like grass is green on the other side situations. So just try to avoid that. Um, learn whatever you can at your role uh, because there's always tons to learn. I guarantee it, um, whatever kind of experience you are at currently. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I, I wanted to come back to something that I think both Michelle and Leon touched on in their in their introductions, which was about um, the up and down trajectory. You know, you're not always landing in the place that you expected, or you know, it takes a an unusual path, um, and then how that appears to the public, right? If we're looking at our LinkedIn profiles, um, you know, it shows only a certain amount of what it is that we did to get to where we are now. Um, so like showing the best of ourselves, I think is how Leon um, put it. And this ties into the question that was in the Q&A as well, where um, we have someone who doesn't have a career yet um, and doesn't have the confidence with their resume. So. I'm wondering if, if um, folks on the panel could talk a little bit about shaping that story, you know, um, thinking about applying for internships or applying for those entry level jobs and wanting to capitalize on previous experience that might not be the one to one ratio that we're expecting that we have to to check all the boxes, right? But like, what is a strategy that we can use to tell the best story um, when we're applying for those jobs and standing out um, amongst all of the applicants? I can try to go first since I think I answered it. I think the original question was from Uni. Um, if I pronounce your name wrong, I'm so sorry. Um, so, um, and then building off of what Chris, uh, Christina said, I'll try to answer that in three parts. The first part being, um, those, those definitely were packed questions. The first part being like um, your experience not being one-to-one -to, -one to maybe the one you're trying to apply to. So for that part, I think that is totally okay. Um, first off, you know, a trick I try to do when I mentor or help other students is uh, you can always tweak your resume a little bit for the job specifically. If you're a 75% match, usually you can tweak it to 85 or even 90% match because a lot of times companies ask for different things. Maybe that specific role is really data-driven. Uh, you may have had some data-driven experiences in some particular projects. 
uh, more than some other ones. So if you really like this company, you really care about this opportunity, definitely take the time to tweak your resume and then submit it. Uh, there's no shame in doing that um, because it's your own work, right? You're just showing a different part of it. The resume is so short. Um, so that's going to be a really important trick. Um, and then going a little bit into uh, the second part of the question, um, going back to Uni's original question of like, what to do if I don't feel like I'm confident, I don't have that many experiences. One thing you can do is, um, first off, like try to make a, I would say like uh, some sort of list or some sort of like, um, I guess, document of all your projects and experiences that kind of relate to UX and then see which ones you can kind of repackage or put on your resume. Uh, maybe you have a school project that you feel like isn't like industry, but there are certain parts of that project, if it's UX related, that you could probably put on your resume that is meaningful to the recruiter, right? Uh, if you look at the job description, uh, the recruiter might say something like, I want someone who has, who's an effective communicator with cross-functional teams, right? That's the common wording. Um, and then in that project, you might've worked with people who, you know, um, had different strength from you. And if you kind of repackage a little bit, I think you can make that experience something that the recruiters are looking for. And there's once again, nothing wrong with doing that. So usually you should try to make your resume at least having three of these um, school projects, side projects, personal projects, whatever you want to call it. Uh, even like a case study, you can try to put it on there because you kind of just need to start somewhere. Everyone needs to start somewhere. Um, if you aren't willing to take that first step, put yourself outside your comfort zone, um, then that's kind of going to be something that is very hard to go to the next stage. Um, if you, I feel like what I said is a bit like technical too. So uh, for uni or whoever else is interested in that, uh, you can definitely feel free to chat with me on LinkedIn as well. So I'll leave it like that for now. Bob or Michelle, do you have any insights you'd like to share? If not, that's totally okay. We can move on to the next question. Yeah, I can throw a few in there. Um, I, yeah, I like what Leon said about uh, making it specific uh, for the role. So um, you want to tailor your application to the specific role. And you, you may be struggling to see how you fit. So you can look up the job right up and see the words that they use and repackage those words in your, your um, application. For me, I do like to see at least, like I'm on the enterprise side, right? So I like to see at least one really good enterprise case study, even if it's spec, doesn't really matter if it's spec, as long as it's a good case study um, for an intern. If you were an interaction designer, it, it needs you need to show a few more, but uh, <clears throat> so consider your area and see if you can pull together a case study that, uh, that really exemplifies that. And <clears throat> another big one for me is to just be yourself. So there's so much stress and tension that goes into it. And often there are quite a few applicants that are going through and everybody's just like trying to be so perfect. And so it does stand out when you show your personality and when you can kind of kind of be who you are and bring that to the table. So that's a big one for me is, um, you know, your work is going to show for itself, but uh, you also you also be want, want to be someone with a really great uh, or an interesting point of view and personality. Yeah, and then um, I'll just wrap on, on that one. I think it's, um, yeah, so those are also really great points. Just to add on, um, definitely be yourself. Don't fake it. Uh, don't pretend to be someone else. If you can fake it for interview, like I believe it's easy, but if you're trying to, like you have to like stay in that persona for long term, that's very hard and you're not going to be happy with it. Um, and then I would say, try to think a little bit about how to make yourself standing out. That's my sounds really hard. But thinking about it, just for me, for my day job, I also hire. Um, so when I was like trying to hire either like interns or like designer, um, I have to be honest, most of the candidates are qualified. You'll find most of people have the similar skill set as you do. So if you're from like UX, probably you know a little bit front end, you know a little bit for like, definitely, you know, user flow, that set of like process. Um, so think about tailoring for um, just echoing what Bob just said, tailoring for what, which company you're actually applying to try to show some case study related to that. If not, think about some other things you can just like, basically you're giving a pitch to that company. Why me? Um, why I'm the best one to enter here? So, um, and um, just an example, thinking about when I was like in, um, interviewing for Microsoft, I didn't have any like 
um, big Canadian um, experience that time. Other two designers going to the same interview as I did. I think like one of them interned at SAP before, the other one interned at Samsung. So I had any, like um, just like literally nothing. Only I had was like a um, RA ship at Emily Carr. So um, the kind of the build your narrative around that. So if I'm, let's say I'm interviewing with Microsoft, um, I'm from a media art background. So it's actually not connecting to the role I'm applying to. So if that's the same situation um, for like a lot of you, you're not from design background, leverage that your background as a strength, not a weakness. So let's say uh, how I build my narrative was I do a lot of like creative tech project and the uh, Microsoft Connect was one of the um, technology I usually use. It's like open source, um, it's like Microsoft product. That's will potentially will help you standing out from like all the other candidates because you use their product and then you know better from that. And then um, definitely like try to think a little bit about um, if you're not from like a traditional art and design background, which is like absolutely like not a weakness, think about the transferable skills you're able to carry over um, for just also take me as an example, um, my narrative was like um, the most valuable thing I learned is to figure out something I don't know. So that, which is also applies to my career as a UX designer. You can say that too. Um, either if you got an interview or like uh, craft that into your website, your portfolio site. So um, yeah, so just to um, make sure to craft your application tailing to a company. Also think about some strategy, how to make yourself stand out. I thought of one more thing too. <clears throat> yeah, go it, ahead. It matters uh, if you know people at that company, um, to get in touch with them. Um, see if you can uh, go for an informational interview. Um, see if you can meet with the person who's hiring or just talk to them and see what they're looking for. Uh, these long-term relationships um, get you to the front where when, you, when you're, you know, the, you know, people make a note and they're like, oh, let me make sure I look at this person. They're really keen. So um, yeah, consider how you can, um, uh, connect. Mentorship's a good way. <laughs> and Bob, you're also uh, a mentor on ADP list. Is that correct? That's a more recent yeah. thing that yeah, you've yeah. joined? Yeah. yeah. It's been, it's been nice to kind of get to see a, a broad uh, group of people and, and be able to help along the way. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, great. I'm, I'm going to move into a couple of uh, specific questions for each individual panelist. So um, I'm going to start with you, Bob, uh, since you're, you're on my screen at the moment. Um, so Copperleaf Technologies is one of Canada's best employers for recent graduates, the top 20 fastest growing software company in Canada and multi award winning uh, as well. Um, so as a design manager, how do you determine the company's internship needs? Mm -hmm. Well, we're looking for someone who uh, we can help grow. So like that's the big part of it is we're, we're, we're looking to um, kind of teach and mentor and grow. So that's a big part of it. And so the company invests in it quite often. Every, every year there's a mentorship round in each department. <clears throat> and often they move to being full-time employees. So yeah, we do this on a yearly basis. Um, for me, portfolio case studies are key. It's sort of, uh, it becomes a reflection of how the, the person's brain and how they think. So when you're writing that and the way you work through problems, it becomes sort of a physical, like a representation of, of uh, your process. And um, how you present the pay case study is also really important. So often um, we'll challenge the designs because we wanna see how the person will think through the process. And so responding, responding to that, like if I'll ask about research, you know, often you can see how deep they went in the project because if they can go right into it and give you answers, then um, um, it, it goes a long way. Um, yeah, and so I mentioned this earlier, but another big thing, uh, at least in my area when I'm hiring is did they falter? And if they faltered, um, how did they recover? So I know, this actually happens more than you would think, or maybe you would think it would happen. Just there's the panic and it just catches up and all of a sudden it's just, it's a catastrophic failure. That is okay, that's fine. Um, so uh, it's actually like, I kind of, I don't look forward to it, but when it happens, I'm like, oh, this is the moment. Let's see how they handle it. And <clears throat> depending upon how they handle it, you know, that actually says a lot um, towards how open they are and, and um, how, um, 
how they're able to deal with some complex scenarios. So uh, it's, it's kind of a good thing in, in a way to have messed up a bit and to be able to speak to it and just own it. And, and even, even some people have said like, yeah, this isn't my, uh, my best skill communicating, but it's something I wanna learn um, if I get to get this role. So that, that matters a lot. Um, yeah, and, and it, what um, I keep saying this, but when you go beyond the basics, it really matters as well. So um, what we look for is, um, do they, um, have they gone deep into research? Have they done any discover work? Um, what insights did they get from research? Often, often a case study just, so when you're in university, you end up doing process work, so process books, and that sort of proves that you did what you were supposed to do. But the difference, I think, when you get out of university is that you don't need to prove what you did. You really just want to give the value. So what insights came from research? And so if those are highlighted, then you're like, okay, they get, they get that I don't care what they did, I care what they found. So that's sort of an insight into um, um, when they've realized that. Um, are they, do they know what user stories are? So have they really been able to narrow down the context? And um, how well are they at communication? Have they reached the point where they're okay to um, communicate risk? So have they talked to failures? What does failure look like? Often, and you'll, you'll see most of, most of what I vet is based around this concept versus being um, perfect versus being honest. So it's, um, you know, if, if is failure okay? And at that point, can you communicate it in time so that it can be corrected and you could be supported? Um, so any, any examples of that uh, being open is really good. Facilitation, leadership skills, um, growth mindset, uh, all these sort of speak to the openness. So these are some things that, uh, that really help in, in like in our area when I'm hiring um, and the, that I look for. That's great. Thank you so much, Bob. I think that's a, a common thread that's come up today um, or in today's discussion is this theme of failure um, and, you know, uh, perhaps thinking of it as failing up um, where, you know, you're you're ready to accept that, you know, we're we're imperfect, um, you know, that we can prepare as much as we want for a presentation or an interview and have all of that really sealed up tightly and like ready to go. Um, but that ultimately that's just one instance, whereas, you know, being able to talk sort of ad lib or to present something and be able to point out where it didn't work the way you wanted it to and how you figured out your way through that problem, um, I think has in, in some ways, perhaps more value in the long run, because it shows that thought process that you're talking about, that complex problem solving, um, as well as that growth mindset, right? That, uh, you know, I'm learning from my mistakes. I am at an early stage in my career where, you know, I have confidence and I know what I want to do, but I also know that um, I'm going to make mistakes. Um, so I think that's there's a fine balance to strike there um, as well. Yeah, and failure is such a key part of the creative process, right? So you yeah, iteration, right. right? So what you 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 learn what you can and you pull the insights and then you create the first version and you fail, like it's part of it. You knock it over. And so the sooner you can knock it over, the sooner you can make the second version. So I think that's why it's so important to me is it's just to kind of get used to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, fail forward, as Leon says, maybe not failing up. <laughs> um, okay, so I have a question for Michelle next. Um, breaking into the creative industry is challenging. Um, much of your recent work focuses on empowering designers through peer communities, networks, and resources. What are some key strategies you share with recent graduates? Yeah, that's a great question. And then just realize I forgot to introduce that in the um, deck. So um, we um, on the site, I also run a community called ECU Design Careers. Uh, we might change the name in the future. So it's an independent um, just community, nothing attached with ECU. But we're just um, hoping a group of friends of like mine, we're just curious about um, what do we provide students with mentors with most relatable experience. Um, so in that case, design student pairing with uh, alumni, alumni mentors who've been through the same struggle as you did, basically. Um, so from there, um, I notice a lot of students 
like most commonly um, asked question or like some just things I noticed. So I would say like first advice, portfolio isn't everything. Um, I wish I know that when I was a student. So um, so definitely I would suggest if you do have a portfolio in place right now, so it's like a first duration, try to spend 50-50 for your time, like 50% work on your portfolio, either it's like crafting the key study, um, visual design, any aspect from uh, the narrative. The other half, like 50, try to use it in network. So networking is really important to build your network. Um, for someone who's like, it might not like be that easy as it sounds. For me, it was difficult because um, I didn't know how to do it basically. Um, coming from the Eastern culture is like totally different. And um, I would say even like attending events like this is a great start. So after that, you can add us on LinkedIn. We're both, we're all hiring. So um, next time probably we'll just um, reach out to you or you see that in our feed, right? So um, that's kind of one way for network. It doesn't have always be like cold reach out someone on LinkedIn. So that's very intimidating. Um, and then so portfolio is in everything. Um, depends on which stage your portfolio is, try to split that time, uh, either like 50-50 or I don't have like portfolio ready yet, maybe spend a little bit more time on that. So let's say 70% uh, on that, 30% on networking, uh, set a little goal for yourself. So I'm going to talk to one people I don't know in the industry every week, um, set something realistic for yourself too. So um, that's like tip number one, I guess. Um, the second one um, it's um, actually advice from um, the panelists yesterday, a, a designer I really look up to, like Scott. Uh, Scott and I used to work at AIK Robotics. Um, I'm the designer after him. So um, that was Scott told me when I was a new grad. He told me like, don't rush into things, which means like, don't try to find a job because you need a job. Uh, it sounds very like unrealistic. Everyone needs a job to make the ends meet. But um, just which is mean, like, if you do know where your passion lies in, you know, that's something not for you, but the opportunity is there. Um, like, just think it twice. Um, so it's going to be might be if you're a new grad, that's going to be your first like full time job. Um, think about it. Do you really want to work here long term? Is that like going to meet um, your career goal, going to really meet your personal life goal? Um, so like think a little bit around that. So there's always something else you can do where like sometimes opportunity just needs a little bit of time. Um, so like make sure you're just like not rushing into anything. Um, lastly, I think it's um, also like trust yourself and then um, ask like after a few years right now on the other side of the table, I have to say um, it's usually it's it is just a business at the end of the day as in like um, hiring manager or like design lead ourselves when we try to make a hire everyone wants this to happen so uh, both parties want this to success so if it doesn't happen don't take it personally so it's not about you most of the time it's only about business we just have to assess who's the best fit in order like culture or like experience so um, don't take it personally and don't lose heart. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we talked a little bit yesterday about reaching out to people on LinkedIn and how important networking is. So I'm glad to hear it reiterated again. Um, I, I definitely know that it's that it's scary to to reach out to people and think that you're you know bothering them or that you know oh I'm sure they get thousands of messages every day. But you know you have to just put yourself out there and put in that effort to to see it return to you so um yeah and and coming to events or going to events coming and going to events i don't even know what's happening anymore um but just participating and listening to what people are saying and and uh, and then reaching out you know like the importance of connecting with the people that you've connected with in some capacity uh, because what an amazing in that is to say, oh, I attended this panel where you were one of the panelists, Michelle, I would love to have a chance to chat with you. You know, there's the introduction, you know, there's the way in um, that isn't as cold as the as a typical cold call or cold email or something like yeah, that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I um, I definitely resonate with that. I have to say, I, um, I think most of my um, job opportunity are landed from like someone I know where I accidentally know them so um where I accidentally talk to so definitely um try to if you're also like just feel it's really weird to call reach out someone on LinkedIn as I do so try the method that Christina just suggested um you can like just have a little bit intro usually you can start with uh, introduction about yourself my name is someone 
uh, I'm studying somewhere and then um, I know you from somewhere and then I want to connect with you because maybe let's say A, I'm interested in your work and second, um, I really found the um, whatever thing you just said in whatever events really helpful. <laughs> the most people will say yes, I would say. Um, so mm -hmm. most of the people, especially design community will be just happy to connect. And then um, you don't have to um, just, but always acknowledge that that might not bring you a job opportunity right away. So, um, but definitely it's very important to scale your network from time to time. So um, yeah, it's a great starting point just to um, getting started. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Michelle. Leon, I have a question for you. Um, so earlier this year, you actually mentioned this article in your introduction, uh, you published on um, the three secrets for getting a UX design internship at a big tech company. So competition is, is challenging and you talk about working hard for the right reasons. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, um... I was a student not so long ago. Um, and I think uh, like when you're in a more competitive environment, sometimes like your not mental model, but sometimes your, I guess, mindset um, really kind of makes or breaks the situation a lot, um, right? Like um, finding jobs, it's like a numbers game. It's also like, sometimes it's a waiting game a lot. And then, you know, like even when sometimes um, your peers, their intentions may Meanwhile, you might see like uh, LinkedIn postings where like, hey, I got the offer here. Hey, I got this there. And then, you know, like some things might be discouraging to you. Some things might make you feel a certain way. And I think when you're in this situation, it's really important for you to kind of keep um, the right mindset. And I think that mindset is you want to make sure everything you're doing is just to improve yourself and trying to get from where you want to your next goal. Um, and that goal, like um, what we mentioned, will definitely be up and down. Um, it might take longer than you expect, but you know, if you really think this is the goal you want, um, then you should be willing to kind of work hard for that. So, um, you know, on the road, on this journey, uh, try not to get sidetracked, try not to get affected by all these other things going on um, in the world, um, kind of going on with your peers. Um, I think that's gonna be really important. I think a lot of times like people really get too stressed and at the end of the day like you know this is just part of your life right? like like your job is just part of your life like your career is obviously super important but you want to make sure that like you're still in that healthy positive mindset and you know you're curious to learn you're happy to try these new things and you're happy to try to work hard for your goal um things that i think i've seen that really lead to negative outcomes is saying that I think as like designers can be competitive sometimes. So I think something that can potentially really harm you is if you feel like, oh, I think I'm better than this person, right? Like how could they get this job that I wanted when I don't, when I didn't get the offer, right? I think these things like will really backfire because even when you get an offer you want, like do you now think you're better than someone else just because you have a job they don't have? Like, so no matter what you go down, like those kind of mindsets will really like not be healthy long-term and it's really bad for your career growth. Um, other things you might be like, oh, I didn't get an offer. Uh, I don't feel like I'm worth anything. Like I'm going to be a failure. Like those things will also really be negative towards you because um, maybe um, for some students I work with, right? Like if they don't get that offer they want, maybe they can um, either pursue some other sort of learning, uh, try to find another passion project, improve in a certain way. Uh, so setting kind of that long-term goal versus that short-term goal will all help with that. And then going back to the question, um, that I think all that will play into like working hard for the right reason. It's really about like having that good uh, mental like place where, you know, like we're working hard for the right reason. Thanks so much, Leon. I think this comes back again to um, uh, another theme, the showing the best of yourself. Um, whether it's on LinkedIn or other social media, you know, there's a, there's a tendency to only want to show the best of what's happening in your life. Um, you see often actually on LinkedIn, people talking about, you know, I didn't get that job. Like I'm going to post something that's different from what everybody else is saying about like, yay, I got this job offer. And I'm going to say like, I didn't get the job offer. Um, so I think, you know, there, there is this tendency to compare 
right? To see what other people are doing and achieving and comparing ourselves to where they are. But we actually don't have any idea what the path or the journey has been for them to that point. So, you know, keeping your eye on where you are and where you want to go, I think is, is kind of the, the point, right? Um, to make sure that we're staying in that healthy mental state as long as possible. So, yeah. Um, I do want to, <laughs> I do want to open it up to the Q&A from the audience. We do have one question um, currently sitting here, so I'm going to present it to the panel. Um, the question is, what should you do if you feel like you're being exploited or harassed? I'm assuming in a, in an internship role, um, like being able to protect yourself in a bad situation. Um, I can just give my perspective. This is sort of maybe a question that can be handled outside of professional contexts. Uh, it's just important to have boundaries, um, uh, professional boundaries you'll need as you go higher anyway and become a manager and lead people. So um, you can, one, you can go back to, so one of the things I mentioned earlier is to know what your values are, right? So obviously it sounds like some of your values are being uh, compromised. So, um, you know, there's varying, varying degrees of how that can happen. But at that point, uh, it's, it's up to, to you to consider um, how you can change that. So if, if you do need to consider when to make adjustments and protect yourself when your boundaries and your values are being crossed. So I think the answer would be to, if that's happening, find out how you can change your scenario. So. It depends in some professional context that can be handled through your lead. And then the, if it's somebody around you, from a, there's like mechanisms to be able to take care of that and to make your work safe, uh, your workplace safe. Um, if it's larger than that and it's a systemic issue, you just maybe want to consider what you can do to change your circumstance. Mm -hmm. And I think like that question is a very serious topic, you know. Um, so I think. Um, my, my wife works at Epic Games as a UX designer. Um, so in the gaming industry, if you follow the news recently, right, um, like with Blizzard, there's a lot of like news related on these topics of like sexual harassment. Um, and then they have really serious consequences, right? Like people are getting seriously harmed. Uh, someone lost their life for this. So if you're really in an environment where the leadership already knows your situation and it's like a very big problem, no one's coming to like help you, always just, you know, just leave the job. Um, your life's not worth uh, losing over things like this. Like protect yourself, I would say. Um, I think that's the bl blizzard thing um, is very serious. So I think if you find yourself in an environment like that, just try to protect yourself by leaving because um, I would say your life is worth a lot more than um, whatever you need to kind of go through in that situation. Right. And then just to add upon that, if it's um, something outside professional context, I would definitely just um, with Bob and then Leon suggested. So um, try to reach out as the resource as you could reach to um, just to um, try to tackle that problem, because it is a very serious issue. Um, if in professional context, which means, let's say, um, you're being overloaded and then your team not supportive, your voice being not heard. So first think about how can you deal with that professionally if it's about professional context. Um, so try to deal with it with no personal like emotion with it. So, um, so first like try how can you uh, communicate with that person for just like subjectively, I'm oh, sorry, objectively <laughs> for just to, um, to make some suggestions. So next time maybe you can try this or that. If you found situations still like that, or it's like just that's the company culture for everyone works like insanely hard and then people expect people to work overtime. So thinking about whether that's going to really um, meet your goal for like if that's something you really care about, you care about the product, I guess that's probably um, not a big issue. But if that's the case, think about um, that's whether where you wanted to pivot for either another company or potentially another group. Um, yeah, so um, definitely it is a serious issue if it's outside professional context. And then, um, yeah, just like hope everyone's just do, um, not going to run into that. Yeah, and if it's a legal thing, um, you can contact HR. So 
that's sort of like there's a scale that you can go down. Legals, HR. <laughs> I would also just add to that, you know, having somebody who can be, if you're, if you're unable to be objective in that situation, which is very probable to have somebody that you trust that comes with you to a meeting so that they can take the notes, they can hear everything that is being said and help you process that information as well. Um, I think often if, you know, if you're in a scenario where the the emotions are really high and you're stressed out or super anxious and it's it's already very um difficult to actually bring that forward and and to officially uh bring forward a, an issue to hr or to legal or something like that you know having somebody to back you up in the room uh not to say anything but to to just be there as like the note taker um, is something that is really important as well. As you progress in your career as well, you'll be able to triangulate on really positive and really negative scenarios. And you should be able to sort of come up with what, what your limits are. So at this point, I'm pretty clear on what my limits are. And when they're reached, it's like, okay, somebody has to fix this or I'm going somewhere else. So um, that's sort of, I think, something that you'll get over time as well. Mm -hmm. I think that also builds off of, I think, something that you said, Bob, about being uh, being clear about what it is that you want, like going and saying, yeah. I want this job, you know, I want to, I want to stay with this company. So, you know, using that as a starting point of allowing your voice to be heard or making sure that your voice is being heard um, as a building block towards setting those boundaries as well yeah. as setting those goals for yourself, right? Um, that we should never, we shouldn't be starting from a place of shame to, to want things for ourselves and to, to need things for ourselves to be healthy in our work uh, and in our lives. So thank you for that question. I don't know if anybody else has uh, questions for the panelists. If not, I have one last one that I wanna ask. We're sort of down to the last few minutes here. Um, so maybe I'll just throw one in. Um, maybe it's not totally throwing it in, but placing it gently in front of you. Um, so what can applicants expect from the interview process? I know there's always this talk about uh, the design challenge um, to, to present in front of a, a large group of people. So what is something that you can kind of anticipate or prepare for? Oh, well, we don't do the challenge for interns. <clears throat> it's uh, more of a learning opportunity for them. So we wouldn't expect them to be able to navigate a challenge um, at the level of a product designer. Uh, but definitely we wanna see their work. We want to be able to challenge them and see how they respond to challenges. Um, really helpful to see their personality and, um, and kind of have them um, explain how they work through problems, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess like short answer, it varies, long answer. Um, most commonly, if it's a UX job or product design job, uh, be prepared to showcase your work. So it could be a presentation, it could be just like a casual walkthrough. Um, I will encourage you to uh, reach out to the, um, whether HR or recruiter, whoever scheduled an interview for you, ask for an agenda. So um, if you couldn't, if that person couldn't tell you, so um, estimate it yourself let's say it's an hour interview so maybe you'll get around like 20 30 minutes to present your work so curate your presentation around that time and then sometimes it may be very short i did like 10 minutes one i did like 45 minutes one so um definitely be prepared to show that so most of the company i guess regardless uh small or big definitely want to see your work during an interview and then um also secondly um i know some company let's say uh Meta used to be Facebook. They used to do like app critique uh, for internship. Not sure whether it's still doing now um, for design challenges. Some of them are like take home. Some of them are on site, which is like whiteboarding. Uh, for my day job, we did whiteboarding. Uh, but when I was like hired, I did take home. So it was like two different experience too. So um, you don't have to be that good at that, but try to not make it the first time you actually doing it. It was that interview. Um, and then try to practice it with maybe like once or twice. Um, so you're not that scared, like mentally, and then so you're more confident walking in a room or on Zoom. 
So um, I think like also a very important part, prepare for some question for the company too. So um, that's also the part when I was hiring, I found a lot of people um, didn't thought about that, obviously. Um, so it's also a great chance for you to ask the company for what's your expectation for this role. Um, let's say also what your um, concerns are or just that's anything kind of can help you to um, assess whether you're able to, you, you wanted to work here or not. And then you can also like ask your uh, interviewer some question. Let's say uh, you might ask, you might be asked some intrapersonal skill question or soft skill question for like some challenge you're facing, um, how you solve the problem. You can ask that to your interviewer too. So um, at least in my perspective, I would say that's a very good question. If someone asked me um, for like, for your time working here, what's your biggest challenge? How your team tackle that? So you can also like, use that as like foreseeing what's going to be the work relationship between the team. Yeah. Um, I think yeah, that question's a, uh, a bit hard to answer, I think, in a few minutes, um, because first off, it really varies so much. Uh, but I like what um, everyone has said so far, especially Michelle, like, um, you know, like, you should be able to kind of get the agenda. Um, most companies will send it. I think the only one I've done that didn't send me an agenda um, and the recruiters that they don't know was like when I interviewed with Apple for internship position a few years ago. Um, and their process is also, I would say, a bit out of the ordinary. It ended up being like a five hour session. And there, there was like a small break in between, but it was like a full site, but kind of virtual. Um, but usually, like for most internships, um, just expect a portfolio walkthrough. And then usually you'll have to do a, some sort of screener with either the hiring manager or the recruiter. And then the kind of key part is just some sort of walkthrough with some sort of behavioral slash technical questions. Um, so that part tends to be quite standard. Some varying factors can be, um, I know Redfin is one that still does app critique. Uh, one of my recent students was like asking me about it. Um, and then whiteboarding, um, a lot of design firms try to do whiteboarding. Um, so that's also something you still might see, but kind of if, you, if you're familiar with the design process, um, you can apply that to everything, right? Like just justify your thought process, kind of talk through your logic while you're doing something. Um, so my, that's my short answer, but it really varies a lot. So just prepare it tailored to whatever agenda is presented to you. Thank you so much, everybody. I know I threw that as a curveball at the very end. I'm sure we could keep talking about that for a while. Um, but unfortunately, that is the end of uh, today's panel. I want to thank Leon, Michelle, and Bob so much for taking the time to join us today and to our audience for joining us as well and for the great questions. Um, so thank you. And I hope everybody got a lot out of this uh, discussion today. Um, and join us again tomorrow for our last panel in the series. Um, so have a great night, everybody. Thank you so much. And we'll see you soon. So long. Thank you.